¿Qué onda, plebes? My name is Mario Navarro. I'm the Mexican PA. Welcome back to the channel. I'm super excited because today we actually have a special guest that we're going to be interviewing, um, Dr. Vikan Kanyalian, who's a board-certified general surgeon working in Southern California. Dr. Vic completed his undergraduate degree at UCLA, did medical school at St. Louis University School of Medicine, and completed a general surgery residency at Harbor UCLA Medical Center in 2006. He has been precepting physician assistant and medical students for the past decade and is super passionate about surgery. And you can find him on Instagram as Dr. Underscore Vikan Underscore Kanyalian, where he features insane footage of real surgery cases. And make sure to also check out his General Surgery Essentials podcast available on Spotify. I'll include all of the links in the description down below. Without any further ado, here is my friend and your general surgeon, Dr. Vikan. What's up, Dr. Vic? Hi, thank you for having me. Good to be here. Thank you for joining us and for being down to answer all of our questions and PA related questions. And we're uh, super excited to, to have you. So we'll just dive right into them. Number one, and for this format, I'm going to be uh, doing things a little bit differently just to kind of give a shout out to all the people that helped me kind of uh, ask and create these questions. I'll be featuring the Instagram handles of the users who submitted the questions. Um, so here we go. Starting with Nat underscore hat zero three. Two questions. What made you go into this specialty and how did that first cut feel like? So the funny part is that when I was in medical school, I had decided that I'm going to do anything but a surgical subspecialty. I was thinking about neurology, infectious disease. Now that wow. I look back on it, I, I would have been miserable. It wouldn't have fit my personality at all. But I wanted to get general surgery out of the way. I did it first with a bunch of students who also wanted to get out of the way. And I realized two or three weeks in that I really enjoyed it, especially the surgeries. And when I saw what laparoscopic surgery was, I was just fascinated by it. So I knew I wanted to do a surgical specialty. So then I thought maybe I could do a subspecialty like urology or uh -huh. even maybe orthopedic surgery. But what I liked about general surgery, there's a lot of internal medicine involved too. So there's a lot of post-operative care and... I like the combination of using my mind for the internal medicine and the combination of working in the OR with the operations. So that that's why I chose general surgery. That's awesome. So the best of both worlds, essentially. Correct. And not just going in there and cutting. <laughs> yeah, and when you ask about the first cut, you know, in residency, you're, they're going to kind of slowly feed you small cases like lipomas and then subsequently maybe inguinal hernias. But it's still exciting, even a lipoma yeah. when you start. Or an abscess incision and drainage. You know, small things. Yeah. Later yeah. on, as you get to your second and third year, you're going to get more and more responsibility. And I remember as second and third year doing appendectomies on five-year-old kids. Wow. And leading an intern through the operation. That is so amazing. It, it was kind of scary, but also very exciting. Definitely. I'm sure that's where you kind of get that, that adrenaline rush, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. And there's an adrenaline rush that you just don't get from any... I would say from many other professions, like I've frequently picture myself not doing surgery, maybe internal medicine or infectious disease, and it just, I, I would not be content. Yeah. Because once you get that rush, you, you need to have it. And if I don't operate for two or three days, I'm just, it's like somebody who needs a drug almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely got a taste of that, like working in the emergency department. Even right now, I just did my first week of uh, OR time with the cardiothoracic surgery team here at UC Davis. And like when it gets exciting and things get intense, it seems like time just like doesn't exist. Like right. you look down at the clock and four or five, six hours have, have passed by in, in a blink. And yeah. so, yeah, it's it's awesome. Next question, Ecruz87 asked, how do you prepare your mindset before going into surgery? So to prepare for a big operation mentally the day before, I'm kind of envisioning the steps of the surgery. Sometimes even when I'm trying to sleep the night before, I think about the next day, think what oh, wow. cases are coming, envision the anatomy, how I'm going to position the patient. I want to make sure my assistant is there if it's a big case. Uh, days in advance, we're making sure that the proper equipment is there. So I'm not the type that's just going to figure out what's going on the next day as, as it comes and then just figure it out in the operating room. That's not a, that's not a good way to, to be a surgeon. You want to have all the variables under control that you can before you go into surgery. Yeah, that, that is that is insane and something that I like didn't consider that you guys do. 
I mean, it makes sense because even, you know, witnessing, you know, for the first time, like surgery, I can tell when, you know, they're considering there's always a plan A, a plan B, C and D. And depending if like a complication or a positioning, you know, of, of a certain like artery or vessel isn't where it needs to be, they'll they'll switch to plan B or C. And so I imagine you probably have are running through all of the different, uh, like you said, variables and plans that that you might yeah, have, to, you have to be versatile because uh, nobody's anatomy is the same. Yeah. People have prior operations, especially in the abdomen. So there's never really anything, quote unquote, straightforward. You have to be ready to just change and adjust. Next question, Emily G underscore 13 asks, what is your favorite tool? And I assume surgical tool. So we use a lot of laparoscopic equipment. There's a lot of cool stuff. Lately, actually, there's a laparoscopic stapler that was in, kind of brought onto the market by a company. And I'm actually going to post a pretty cool video on it at some point. But you could control the, uh, the angle of the staple with some buttons on the outside rather than just mechanically doing it. Oh, so wow. it has this cool kind of robotic function where you can go left to right and then back to the neutral position just by pressing some buttons on the handle of the stapler. I feel like I've so, seen pictures of, of it. Um, yeah. it's, it's also kind of like a long, like almost like a duckbill device, right? Right. Yeah, it has jaws that open up and then you can close it from the outside too. To, so it'll clamp onto the tissue and staple across it. So in the field of laparoscopy especially, it's cool to see the new modern technology that we use in, in intraoperatively. That's awesome. And do you do kind of like a side question? Do you usually do like yearly conferences where you're seeing like new technology that's coming out? So I'm kind of on the forefront of things. I get to see a lot of the equipment before other surgeons. And sometimes I'm even involved in the development of the equipment, which is cool. That's in awesome. fact, a few years ago, I was involved in going out to a big company's headquarters and evaluating this uh, instrument, giving some recommendations. And I just found out two weeks ago that they actually are going to bring that to market and they're following some of those recommendations, which I had some input in. So it's kind of exciting. That is awesome. That is awesome. And would you say that you are can only really do that because you're like in private practice um, or do you feel like you have more flexibility because of, of, of working, you know, in your own practice? No, not necessarily. In, in fact, even people in academics will have more influence over the equipment and have more interaction. But uh, these companies, they do want to hear a private practitioner's opinion as well. So yeah, a lot of times they approach me for feedback on things. That's awesome. All right. Our next question is from Nat.Helms. What tip would you give your past self when starting as a new surgeon, as a new surgeon? And similar, I guess, in, in the same lane, Jordan J. Relay asked, and what do you wish you knew before starting residency? So what tip would you give yourself, you know, when you were young and what did you wish you knew? Well, when I finished medical school, I had really good grades and I got into, you know, the residency that I wanted, but honestly, my ego was kind of out of, it was out of control. Uh, and the first year or two years of residency, I kind of struggled. I was batting heads with a lot of the attendings and I had some really low points. I even had a couple of attendings tell me that I should not even do surgery, that my heart was not into it. Part of that was because I had come back to Southern California from the Midwest. So I was hanging out with my friends again and stuff like that. But mo most of it was, I kind of had this attitude that I had already achieved everything I wanted to. And and general surgery residency or any residency, that's just not going to work. Yeah. So I got I, I got brought down to earth big time. I, uh, I had kind of like a come to Jesus moment <laughs> my second year. And I had some rough times. But thankfully, I turned it around my second and third year. And I really showed effort. I completely turned it around. And at towards the end, I was I gained the trust of all my attendings. They treated me like one of them at the end. Uh, they let me do really cool cases because they trusted me. So I, I, I turned it around. I had enough time, but I did kind of waste that first year where I, I could have been more productive. Yeah. And so kind of that, that second question, what, what do you wish you knew before uh, starting residency? Well, it's just there's going to be so many highs and lows. Uh, I would suggest to anybody that you kind of just take things day by day, rotation by rotation, and maximize what you get out of it. If you start thinking about where the end of the road is, which is six or seven years down, you'll, you'll just get really depressed. 
So you just have to kind of just take on each rotation as it comes and, you know, have an overall plan, but not think about the final, you know, goal too much or else it can get pretty dark. I mean, I only, I only have like six months left of PA school until I can like see on the horizon, like the, the destination. And, but even like this past week, like waking up at four 30 and walking into hospital at 5 AM, I'm like the privilege that we have to be able to, to care for people and, and do what we do. It's like huge. And so I've been trying to like just pinch myself here and there to like remind myself of how like the privilege that we have. All right. Next question. Sanchez 16 ask, is your life completely revolved around your profession or can you still, or do you still pursue other hobbies? So I used to work much more before, uh, but now that I'm married and I have several small children, uh, I really try to kind of have more of a work life balance. Yeah. But at the beginning of my career, I wanted to really establish myself and uh, establish a foundation for my family and buy a house and all, all that stuff. So I would do it again the same way. Yeah. So 10 years ago, I would be operating all Saturday and Sunday. There'd be no difference between weekdays and weekends. But now that I'm married and have a family, I definitely try to be home as soon as I can and, uh, in terms of other interests, I made it a point, especially in the one last like one to two years to really get more into fitness, proper diet. And it helps me all around just with my mood, stress relief, also just like dealing with some ergonomic issues in the operating room with back pain. It's really helped me out with that. So um, more and more, and especially as I get older, that becomes more important to proper diet and nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. And those ergonomics. I was even on my first case, I was like, my back is like hurt and had like no stamina whatsoever to just be like standing there for, for that much. Yeah, I've, I had, just... I've had days where I've, the most cases I've done in one day is nine of them. Wow. And, uh, I remember I would come home. I wouldn't even be able to pick up my son. That was like 15 pounds because I couldn't even lean over. It was so painful. So it's a lot of surgeons do suffer from those issues over the years. So I'm trying to be more conscious of it and try to prevent that. That's, that's good to hear. Gonzalez underscore 12 asked, what is the most valuable lesson that you have learned, I guess, on this, on your journey? Well, just to be humble, which is kind of ironic that a surgeon says that. I mean, you do need confidence as a surgeon. You don't want to go see a surgeon. You walk into the room and they can barely look in your face and are, you know, not confident about the plan. Yeah. But at the same time, this, this career will knock you down uh, the second you think you're you know, a quote unquote badass you can do an amazing case. And if you don't do something proper the next day, you know, you will be, you will be brought down to earth very quickly. Like I said, I, I didn't have that self-awareness when I was younger, especially the beginning of residency, so, but yeah. it's something you'll develop or else, uh, you know, emotionally, it'll be very tough to deal with complications, which every surgeon gets. I don't care. The only way to avoid complications is just to sit at home and not operate, which we're not going to do. So, yeah, like you said in you know your past interview with Rachel, the highs are really high and and the lows can be really low, and you just got to be ready for both. So, these next questions. So, to to my understanding, if I heard correctly, and you you know the past interviews, you have PAs that work with you in your practice. Is that correct? So, there's PAs that are employed by the hospital. One of the hospitals I go to, they mainly assist in the operating room. I Got more it. frequently in the operating room work with uh, an RNFA, which I've worked with for the last two to three years. Okay. And uh, we work very, very closely together. We've done hundreds, if not thousands of cases, you know. And you said, R I haven't heard this before, RNFA? Yeah, that's basically an, an RN who's become a first assist. Oh, wow. It's a circulating nurse who, after a couple of years working as a circulator, can accumulate hours scrubbing in with surgeons and become a first assist. So it's kind of a fun job. If I was a nurse, yeah. I would definitely go down that route. All yeah, they do is all day is assist surgeons. Yeah, because I didn't even know that that was an option. Like I knew PAs could function as first assist, and but to hear RNs doing that as well is 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 amazing. Yeah, I think there's some regional differences nationally on yeah. which one is more um, preferred. Preferred, exactly. But yeah. definitely on the West Coast, I mean, our hospital has three RNFAs. Wow. And I feel like every 
like as time flies, I'm I'm learning that there's just so many other like avenues in in medicine and like careers that I had never heard of. And so definitely if you're watching this and you're like a high school student or a first year in college, like definitely look like it's the only the careers in medicine aren't just, you know, MD, PA, DO, like there's so much other um, opportunities out there. And so definitely do your research and to see what you want to be and what you want to do. So this next question was asked by Rudy Medina, 2014. He asked, what role does a PA play in the OR and does it change between different types of surgeries? Yeah, so the PAs I work with in the operating room are acting as first assistants. They can close the wound. Uh, outside of the operating room, you'll be seeing consults, evaluating the patients daily on rounds, writing progress notes, and then moving staples. You could even be doing small bedside procedures, you know, under supervision. So there's a wide array of things a PA can do. Yeah. And then if you go into other fields like critical care, even interventional radiology, you could be doing a lot of procedures under a physician supervision, but you you could be acting pretty independently, doing pretty cool procedures. Actually. During uh, this rotation I'm on, all uh, the PAs are the ones that essentially harvest the the veins for right. for bypass, and literally the the like attending physician like isn't even in the room. They just right. have so much trust in the PAs that they're just you know going to town doing their thing. Mm -hmm. And once the veins harvested, the surgeon comes in and then they start doing the actual graft part. And it was just insane to to watch and to see them do that on their own. Yeah, the PAs can have a pretty big role in a cardiothoracic practice, especially yeah. in the post-op care as well, removing chest tubes, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and similar question, carlitos.jpg asked, is there any chance a surgeon would let a PA do a surgery like a resident would? I don't think so. There is going to be a lot of first assisting and there can definitely be parts of the operation that a PA can do, maybe even clipping structures, cutting them. Yeah. But I could tell from my personal experience, I haven't, you know, stepped back and talked to PA through an operation. Got it. Got there's, it. And there that's, might be that's some, li no. there'll be liability issues and uh, there's some scope of practice issues, which may, you know, come into play. Yeah, no. And it's good to know because again, as like students watching this, they're trying to figure out what they want to do. And if they're, it's in their heart and they know that they were put on this earth to be a surgeon and be the one, you know, leading an operation, taking on that responsibility, like go and become a doctor. Like you won't be satisfied as a PA. And so I'm glad that you, you say that so that we put all expectations out on the table for mm -hmm. students. Scrubs underscore and underscore sunshine asks, what are your top three tips or pieces of advice for students starting their surgical rotation? Well, I would start off by reading in advance textbook like Lawrence Essentials of General Surgery. And then the main thing is to really know everything about your patients. Show up really early, a lot earlier than you're attending. Because what frustrates me the most is when I tell students to arrive somewhere at 9 a.m. And as I'm pulling up, I see that they're also parking. That's like a bad sign. Yeah. If that means you're not going to know anything about my patients. Usually I know everything about them already from my house. I'll check. But their job is to know everything and I'll call them on it. You know, I'll ask all I've asked students. I'm like, do you know if that patient's alive that we operated on? And if they don't know, I'll just I'll be super critical of them. I'm like, yeah. so you can't you know, you can't tell me if that patient is even alive at this point. Do you know what happened? Sometimes I'll make it up just to emphasize. I'm like, do you know what happened last night to that patient? And then, although nothing happened, it's a, a way of me getting the message across that you're not here just to watch surgeries and then suture. You have to yeah. take care of these people post-op. That's the important part. Yeah, definitely. One of the, the the big differences between other rotations is the amount of like, I guess, preparation that I've had to do for this rotation in terms of like reading up on cases and like just being prepared to like, for instance, this past uh, Thursday, I actually presented um, on a on a case on uh, the, one of the patients that was like post op day six after after a uh, a bypass and like doing all of that preparation beforehand the night before and then showing up you know two hours before um, the the team to go see the patient prepare the presentation look at all of the eyes and like there's just so much more I think preparation that students should be doing for your surgery rotation it's just kind of like. Um, and because of it, I'm starting to get messages from other 
you know, uh, like faculty saying like, oh, you know, we hear that you're doing great with the CT surgery team. And so it, it, it is leaving a positive impression, like putting in that extra effort and extra work. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of on that same, I know you, you just mentioned one of the books, but Miriam Perez asks, is there any books that you recommend to help with foundation and skills used in surgery? Yeah, a good baseline book, which is going to be appropriate for uh, PAs and medical students is Essentials of Surgery by Lawrence. That's what I have all of my students read. Okay. You can also have in your white coat during your rotation, uh, a book called... Is it Surgical uh, Recall? Yeah, Surgical Recall. Yeah. And then there's Advanced Surgical Recall if you really want to do like residency or become a surgical PA. So okay. those are, I think, the must-haves. All right. I'll make sure to, to attach a link to all of those books in the description below. That's good to know. All right. Next question. Ah, BBZ and a pre-PA student, Christopher Rojas, and uh, asked, what do you expect from PA students that work with you? And what are things that make students stand out in a positive way? And so I know we talked kind of a little bit about being, you know, prepared and showing up early. And, but if there's any other pointers that you have, they'd be appreciated. I want my students to be organized. I've had students who have all the information written down, but it's crumpled up in 10 different pages and it takes five minutes for them to find the labs from yesterday. I want organization, make cards, have the H and P in the front on the back. You could have individual days with all the labs and I's and O's and vital signs. Because what I tell all my PA students are, you know, I'm not expecting, you know, I'm not expecting them to know everything about surgery. I really don't care how they suture. That could all be taught. Yeah. But what I do want to see is professionalism, being on time. And like I said, being on time means like being an hour early. <laughs> yeah. Knowing everything about the patients, being organized. What's also important to me is how the students interact with the operating room staff. I have actually fired a couple of students off of rotations because of their interaction with either myself or with staff at the hospital, because we're just not going to tolerate it. Yeah. And there's some very rarely, I could say one out of two in the past 10 years, there will be a student who think they're entitled and who actually think that they're surgeons already. And, you know, they don't need to go get their gloves and gown and that just ain't going to work. Yeah, definitely. Because the second you start disrupting the operating room and creating a negative atmosphere, you'll just be off the rotation because you are going to be there only to create positivity and help. The second it's a hindrance, I already have the green light from the program directors I work with that no questions asked, they're gone. Yeah. But you yeah. don't want to be that one or two people every five years that everybody still talks about because, you know, you came in with an attitude and... It's basically like when you go to somebody's house, you don't just walk in there and walk around the house and start exactly. touching things. You know, treat it like you're walking to somebody's living room and just be respectful. And your yeah. rotation is going to be much better. When you do mess up, people are going to want to help you. But if you yeah. have an ego and you do mess up, then everybody's just going to pounce on you. Definitely. Yeah. And like I was telling, like I've been very thankful to all of the staff that I've been working with and just like, Keep realizing that like it's a privilege to be witnessing you guys doing your thing and to be in your you know in your room in your home that is that is the OR and being mindful and respectful of that and so I, I love the way that you that you put that that like we we shouldn't be a hindrance but should be an addition to the team and and bring positivity um, to to the team um, so I, I love that next question so I know we kind of talk, this was a question that I had, like, what would make a student uh, stand out in a negative way, but you kind of just already hit those points and uh, about, you know, like being late and being unprepared, being unorganized, or just having this like ego, um, or just feeling entitled in the operating room. And like, none of those things are going to fly. And so yeah, definitely don't do those things when you're on your surgery or any rotation for that matter, I think. Yeah, like across the board, you should be respectful and kind to everyone from the head honcho attending down to our EVS and the people who are, you know, cleaning our rooms and turning over rooms. Like everyone deserves your, your respect and friendliness at all times. Yeah. All right. Another question that I had, are there any differences in the way that you precept your medical students versus your PA students? 
So when they rotate with me, they're treated equally. They have the same functions. The only time I differ a little bit is if I start doing didactic things and I start telling them about questions that may pop up that I've seen over the years. Mm-hmm. I definitely do delineate sometimes. Like med student, they may get into this detail. PA student, I wouldn't worry about this much detail. What they're going to focus on with you is blank. Yeah. So that's about the only time. Other than that, everybody is equal. All right, we're kind of coming to the end and some lighter questions. Enjoy life on Instagram asks, what shoes does he recommend for my flat AWS feet? So my wife is actually a podiatrist, so oh, wow. I get really good foot care because especially in residency, I used to wear these flat like Puma shoes, which looked really cool. And I was doing seven hour cases and just having intense foot pain all night. Ouch. So I have like high arches and footwear is important. So my wife has steered me towards brands like Brooks is good, New Balance. I think Hoka is another good one. But usually if it looks really cool, it's probably not good for standing all day. (laughs) But I think Brooks, I wear Brooks all day. I don't wear surgical clogs anymore because those don't even have arch support. So I don't wear Birkenstocks or clogs. I wear Brooks all day and it has changed my life. And, you know, they don't sponsor me. I'm not getting anything back from them. I'm just telling you, I have no foot pain, but it's mainly because of uh, the art support that you need. Yeah, that, that's and amazing. If, if things get really bad, there's a lot of nurses who come see my wife. A lot of surgeons come see my wife. You can just get custom orthotics made and that'll that'll help you out. Oh, good to know, because that's not something I had to consider, like doing custom orthotics. That's yeah. that's really good but you heard it here guys brooks and i actually endorse it too because i have a pair of brooks and they have been saving my life i mean i'm i'm the cases with the ct surgery team are like at least this last one that we did was like a nine hour case and so regardless of the footwear like if you don't have the stamina that like surgeons like dr vic has um, your feet are gonna hurt like my feet were so sore after the end of that case but um yeah buy yourself a pair of brooks to another lighter question from some of my fellow buds, future PA underscore Renee and my buddy Brian Gordillo asked if, you know, if they're hiring at your uh, practice. So, yeah, my students always ask me, why don't I hire a PA? And I tell them, well, I basically have like four of them for free because you guys yeah. function as PAs. And when PA students rotate with me, you know, not to pat myself on the back, but they say it's the best rotation. It's the hardest rotation of the year, but it's the most rewarding. And some of them miss it a lot because it's the first time where they actually feel like they're part of the team. They see consults on their own. They're extremely independent, of course, with my supervision. But uh, this is not a rotation where you shadow. Like, it is intense. Every second that I work, you are there. Actually, you're there more because you're there before me. Yeah, And by the end of it, I mean, if you're a med student, you're ready to be an intern usually. And if you're a PA, the rest of the rotations will be super easy. And usually you can impress people because it's not going to get much harder than this rotation. Yeah, that was kind of like what I was telling my wife. I'm like, these next two weeks that I'm going to be like in the OR and with the team, like I'm going to get there like super early and probably leave super late. And just it's only, you know, a few weeks of putting in like hard work. Yeah, but it's good to know that like as a student that I can like rise to the occasion, right? And like rise to the level that like preceptors like you um, expect us to rise because that's where I think you experience the most like growth as a student. And you said it yourself, like after they leave your rotation, they like can impress others and, and the other rotations seem very much more relaxed compared to, to being with you. And so that yeah, and usually later on when they're looking for jobs, a lot of them use me as references. Uh, I've I've helped them get pretty good jobs actually. Where I'll get a call from, you know, for example, I had a really good student a couple of years ago who wanted who moved to Austin, Texas. I got a call randomly got from somebody in Texas. It was an orthopedic surgeon who had met with her the day before. Oh wow! Everything had gone really well, but I just closed the deal for her. I told them if you don't hire this girl you'll be making a big mistake. And he said, you know what? I was already thinking that and you just like confirmed it. Amazing. So I, I help out those guys that, you know, and girls that they work hard. Yeah. Uh, it's, and- it's very rare that later on I won't, you know, help somebody or at least be a reference for them. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's another it's thing. It's a two-way street, you know. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's also something for the students watching this to keep in mind that our rotations aren't just, you know, us training and, and shadowing, you know, like Dr. Vic said, like they're very much like either mini interviews or you're essentially networking with, you know, professionals that can have an impact on your future career, you know, your future job opportunities. And so viewing it from that lens and that these are like essentially mini job interviews or, or mini networking opportunities, it just it makes you realize like what's kind of at, at not at stake, but like the value and the opportunity that's at hand. Right. And, yeah, and it's a very small community. So uh, if you think that you're just having a bad relationship with one hospital, we, we, I know every hospital in Southern California, you know, I know yeah. surgeons everywhere. So if you think, yeah, you know, I just won't apply to La Salle because I had a bad relationship there. I'll just coast through this rotation. Word gets around very fast because there's only so many operating rooms in Southern California. There's oh, only yeah. so many surgical positions as PAs. So I would suggest, you know, don't burn bridges anywhere. You don't know where you're going to run across that person later on. Definitely. It could, definitely. It could be, you know, some if you have a poor interaction with the doctor, and I have to tell this myself too. Yeah. There are several internal medicine doctors who I've just wanted to basically take outside to the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> lack of a better, yeah. Yeah, the way they've interacted with me or just how inappropriate their care has been. But I have to remain professional. And you know what? You don't know. Exactly. Now, he could be a chief medical officer of some large insurance company or HMO. And then you'll have an adverse impact on your you know, on your business and income. So yeah, everybody, you know, you always, it's just a small community. That's all say, oh, that's what I want to say. You know, everybody's yeah. going to know each other and you're going to run across the same people over and over again. So just try to be cool with everybody. And then eventually it'll just uh, help you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, Dr. Vic, I think that is all of the questions that we have. And I want to give a shout out to everyone who helped me with this video by submitting their questions through Instagram and YouTube. If you enjoy this type of